In this week alone, the top U.S. Diploma diplomat for Ukraine told Congress that the president withheld military aid for personal political gain. Republican Congress members stormed a secure room at the Capitol, where many already had access to dispute the impeachment process, but not the substance. And we have learned that the Department of Justice is investigating its own FBI for looking into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. Amidst all this, the White House announced that the president has ordered the cancellation of all federal government subscriptions to The New York Times and The Washington Post. That makes it a perfect moment to hear the analysis <laughs> of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. So, David, no subscriptions to the White House from your newspaper. This explains why I've been getting no invites. <laughs> but, but you'll soldier on. Um, but let's let's pick up first with Lisa's reporting on these federal judges uh, that Trump has been able to, to nominate and and get successfully confirmed more judges than any of his predecessors. What's the real significance of this? Well, when you talk to <coughs> conservative voters, why they support Trump, that's the number one answer to the courts. And so he is having an effect. He's, he's nominating conventional Republican Federalist Society judges. They're not populists. I'm not sure I see the, quite the transformation on the circuit court level, the level just under the Supreme Court. Of the 13 appellate courts, uh, only one may flip. So you've got Democratic seats staying, Democratic districts saying Democratic, Republicans getting a little redder, but you haven't seen a transformation from a more liberal court to a more conservative court. And his impact on future uh, nominations may go down because Democratic judges are not retiring. They're waiting and hoping there's a Democrat. So they're, it's expected there'll be relatively fewer openings over the next couple of years than there were the previous. So, Mark, maybe not transformational? Uh, I, I think it, I think it uh, approaches transformational, Judy. I, I just point out in Lisa's speech, she made the point that these were fired up, that this issue fired up Republican voters. Make no mistake about it, she's absolutely right. Uh, in the exit polls in 2016, when 23,000 actual voters were polled, and they asked, what's the most important issue that you're deciding on? A full one out of five voters uh, answered the, the, the Supreme Court nominations and judicial nominations. And uh, they broke for Donald Trump uh, overwhelmingly, I mean, almost by three to two. Uh, and th th those who just considered it an important issue or not as important issue, judicial, uh, all vote for Hillary Clinton. I mean, this was this was a, a turning and key vote. Promise made, promise mm -hmm. delivered. Uh, he is totally, uh, as David pointed out, his good, his appointments have come from the, the Federalist Society. And the other factor is they're playing the actuarial charts. I mean, they're younger. Uh, the, the Neil, Gorsuch, Neil, uh, Neil Gorsuch, for example, was 49 when he was nominated. Brett Kavanaugh is 53, right? Uh, most recently, a 35-year-old. Uh, so uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a real change, and it's, it's a promise made, promise delivered, uh, much to the consternation of a lot of Democrats. Well, we know it flies under the radar, and that's why we thought it was so important uh, uh, to, to take a look at it. We are grateful for Lisa's reporting. Impeachment. Uh, David, there was virtually a development every day about that. Uh, uh, we just learned uh, today that a federal judge has said that the impeachment inquiry in the House, in his view, is legal. And that means that the Department of Justice is going to have to turn over uh, grand jury material from the Mueller investigation. But this follows a week of testimony behind closed doors, some of it, though, made public uh, by one public servant or diplomatic figure after another, including especially William Taylor, who served as the ambassador uh, to Ukraine. What is it adding up to at this point? Yeah, when we first learned about the phone call, you could say, well, it was just Trump being Trump, a reckless phone call, and he was sort of elbowing the guy. Uh, now that, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've learned this was a three-month coordinated campaign with a whole series of meetings, a lot of people involved, to try to get Ukraine to help Trump's re-election bid. And so the Taylor testimony in particular was detailed, methodical. It was the smoking gun. It was queer, quid, quid pro quo, and order coming from the president to hold up aid, uh, unless Ukraine did this. And so that seals the deal, I think. And I think Republicans, uh, at least the Republican establishment, has to feel just beaten. And the question is, how do they find a way to stick with them? <laughs> but, but I think the Republican mood was, wow, this is bad. Wow, this is bad. 
And so I, I think the key thing is to look for sort of an emotional crumbling where they just say we have to, we, ha we can't sit by along this. I don't think we're at that place, but it was certainly uh, a week that has affected how Republican senators see this guy. Because, I mean, David's right, Mark, at this point, Republicans are, most of them, the vast majority of them, are saying they still don't see the solid evidence. No, they, that, that's the, the, those who make public statements, uh, those who don't, don't say that. I mean, and I think it, the silence does, uh, does speak, if not volumes, at least chapters. Um, Ambassador Taylor's testimony was not a smoking gun, it was a smoking armory. I mean, it really did. It, 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 David's right, it was specific, it was factual, it was compelling. Um, and w what I found most revealing about this is I went through Michael Atkinson, who was the, uh, the uh, Inspector General, Michael McKinley, uh, 37 years of service at the State Department, uh, Ambassador Taylor, Maria Ivanovich, uh, Laura Cooper, Fiona Hill, 163 years of public service. No hedge funds, no high tech uh, buyouts or whatever else. I mean, these are people who have devoted themselves. And, and, and I think uh, Ambassador Taylor was, was the witness from hell for the White House. He really was. I mean, 49 years of public service, brought back in after retirement at the insistence of the Secretary of State. And he cannot go unmentioned that Mike Pompeo is violating every rule of the United States military on the responsibility of an officer to his men and to those under him. Um, he, he has totally abandoned uh, and not stood up for any of the people he's appointed. Secretary of Secretary State. Secretary of State. And, and these professionals who have come forward at considerable cost and, and risk to their own careers in many instances, certainly their peace of mind. Um, and I, I think his silence is a, a compelling indictment of him and his lack of character. But as, as we see, David, the White House continues to say, um, and, and the president is raging about this. We heard it again today. He's saying these people have no credibility. And he was saying yesterday uh, they're part of the so-called deep state uh, and uh, using a lot worse language than that. Yeah, and, and so far that's holding. The, uh, Impeachment is popular in the country, but it's very popular on the coastal parts of the country. Amy Walter pointed out this week that uh, in the swing states, its favorability rating is 10 points lower than unfavorable. People are against impeachment. In Wisconsin, it's minus seven. And so for Democrats to think that they can swing Republican senators, they have to get those swing states and they have to tell the message. And so far, they have secret hearings which I understand, you don't learn anything in a public hearing, they have to learn what happened, and so you have to get away from TV cameras for that. But eventually they're gonna to have to turn to public hearings in order to try to persuade the country. And whether they can do that in a month or two, whenever that happens, um, that, that we'll see. Some reporting that it may happen in, in just a couple of weeks. It, separate from this, Mark, but some people think related, uh, you had this uh, revelation reporting yesterday that uh, the Department of Justice, which had been overseeing a probe into the origins of the Russia investigation, what the Russians did to affect the 2016 election. That was an inquiry. It's now a criminal investigation, a criminal probe. Um, and, and the question, which raises all kinds of questions. I mean, how did it become that? We don't know. But I just want to show um, for, uh, for all of us, this is a comment from Senator Mark Warner, who's the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He said, Senate Intel wrapping up a three-year bipartisan investigation. We have found nothing remotely justifying this. He said, Mr. Barr, referring to the attorney general's investigation, has already jeopardized key international intelligence partnerships. He needs to come before Congress and explain himself. What's this, what, how much does this matter that this has become a criminal probe? Well, I think it does matter, starting with the Mark Warner point. I mean, in, a, in an ocean of roiling, rancid partisanship, the Senate Intelligence Committee has been an island of, uh, of collegiality and cooperation. So I don't know if he uh, is speaking just for himself as the ranking Democrat and co-chair of that committee uh, or with the acquiescence of uh, of Senator, Senator Burr, the chairman, I don't know. But it, it certainly is a serious thing. I mean, it, it, you have to come to the conclusion, Judy, that in Bill Barr, Donald Trump finally got the attorney general he wanted. 
Um, he, you know, the, Jeff Sessions didn't deliver for him. Jeff Sessions yeah. recused himself. Um, I mean, his, Bill Barr is at, at, at taxpayer expense uh, hurling around the globe from Australia to Italy uh, in, in pursuit of, of information to somehow rationalize, justify that Donald Trump didn't lose in, uh, in, in, in 2016 and that the Obama campaign, the Obama administration was somehow behind some spying on him. And, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Warner's point is, that, I mean, after a three-year investigation by that committee, there's absolutely nothing uh, that has come to support that. I, and I, I don't know what the answer is. David perhaps does. I, of course, know the answer. I know you it's, um, you know, you have to, having thoroughly politicized the State Department, you have to go in with the presumption Trump is trying to politicize the Department of Justice, and you have to go in prejudging against that. The one mitigating factor is the guy they selected to do the investigation, this guy, John Durham, who has been appointed by both parties, who mm -hmm. has uh, done, who has right. a, goal, a sterling reputation. So at least we can um, rest, I think, in trust with him. And that's, that's really, this goes to what Mark was saying. The whole question for the last two years, would our institutions hold? Yeah. And I have to say, given the testimonies of the last week, and whatever Durham does, I think the institutions are sort of holding. And the result is this impeachment, a guy who, a president who does not go by any institutional logic, does not obey institutional rules, and yet the institutions are sort of standing up for those rules. A couple of minutes on the, uh, to, to, to look at the 2020 field. Uh, Mark, there are 18 still in the race. We had Tim mm -hmm. Ryan, the congressman right. from Ohio, drop out uh, just, just yesterday. But 18 still running. And there is reporting out there, you've seen it, that some Democrats are getting anxious because they're worried they still don't have a horse that can beat Donald Trump. Uh, how widespread do you think that worry is among I, Democrats? I'd say it's a, it's a, a lively anxiety. I mean, the, <laughs> the flaws or the defects of the top four candidates, uh, I mean, on ideological grounds, uh, fear, fear the Democrats have with Senator Warren and Senator Sanders, that they're far to the left, that they're vying for a, sort of a liberal sliver of the electorate right now, that, that uh, Vice President Biden may not be uh, the Joe Biden that we come to know and love in previous years, that Pete Buttigieg is a mayor of a very small city uh, with a male partner uh, and married to, is uh, maybe uh, 37, just a little bit more than uh, the country's ready for. And especially in an election where they want the referendum to be on a, a flawed, damaged, uh, manifestly imperfect incumbent. Uh, so. You know, I think that whether it's Michelle Obama or whatever else, I mean, Democrats are kind of casting around looking. I think the key question Democrats have to face is this, Judy. There are 206 counties that Barack Obama carried twice that Donald Trump carried in 2016. And if the Democrats can go back and carry those counties again, these are people, you can't call, you be a racist. Um, and I think that's the question. Can Democrats do that? And is that the kind of candidate and campaign they want to run? Yeah. The, uh, both, two years ago, I thought the two strongest Democratic candidates were Mitch Landrieu, the former mayor of New Orleans, and Deval Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts. And they're not in the race. Neither so, one. Got neither it. one in the race. So I do see the sense of the anxiety. But I would say to Democrats, if you're unhappy with the top four, look at the bottom 14. Yeah. Because they're, they're perfectly serviceable, good candidates there, in my opinion. Amy Klobuchar, Michael Bennett, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris. And so... Steve Bullock. Steve Bullock. So I, I think, you know, look around. Like, try, it, try out some others if you're ha unhappy with the top four. Well, one of, the, one of the challenges they have is just getting attention with all the focus in no, Washington true. on impeachment and, and everything else. It's, it's hard for them to, to, uh, to get uh, airtime, shall we say. One thing we want to note at the, beginning of the, at the end of the program is that, as we near the end of the program, is that the NewsHour announced today that we, are, we will be hosting, moderating a Democratic presidential debate oh. uh, toward the end of December, December 19th. Terrific. So we are looking forward to that opportunity. Oh, wonderful. And with that, Mark Shields, Boy. David Brooks, have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. you.